so this video took me a while to finally get around to, and though one of those reasons is because I wanted to make this video as in-depth as I possibly could, the biggest factor was some technical issues. Doom 2016 had a lot of leeway with rendering on PC, and while you could render the game in OpenGL, the game was more optimized for Vulkan rendering at the cost of some compatibility issues. Doom Eternal, or rather the id Tech 7 engine as a whole, exclusively Vulkan rendering, which is great if you're just playing the game, but playing it and recording it has been a huge pain in my <laughs> It's not often that you come across a game in development where the hype and excitement for the game builds exponentially with few dips leading up to the release, let alone a game that not only was worth the hype, but also exceeded personal expectations and delivered a fun and unique experience that I can't really find anywhere else. I am of course talking about Night Dive's port of Doom 64. Where else can I find this amount of unskippable splash screens? Seriously, there's so many. Nah, I'm kidding. It's Doom Eternal. That's loud. Seriously, the hype for this game has been unreal. I can't think of a single other game where I got more excited the longer I waited. Hell, even Mega Man 11's hype plateaued for me nearing release, but Doom Eternal? Oh my lord. I can thankfully say that the game is everything that I wanted it to be and more. A challenging yet fair balance of gunplay and combat puzzles that I was desperately hoping that it would be. Especially after the game was delayed from November all the way to March, expectations were kinda high. By the way, we play on Nightmare difficulty around here. Why? Cause Doom Eternal is kind of easy. Sort of. The game has an arcade style live system that to my knowledge doesn't cap in a single playthrough. I finished the game 100%ing it with nearly 40 extra lives left. If this live system weren't a thing, this game would be one of the most challenging games that id Software had ever produced. Luckily for us, that can still be experienced in Ultra Nightmare. You know, that permadeath difficulty that I completely forgot to bring up in my 2016 review. Instead, they're replaced with full armor restores and the occasional supercharge. Yeah, supercharges are back, and they even look like the screaming blueberries that we used to know and love. Actually, Actually, a lot of the items and enemies resemble their classic counterparts, more so than their 2016 look. But unlike other nostalgia pandering, I think that it works more in this game's favor for what it's trying to be. Doom 2016 found this weird balance between classic and grounded realism with its presentation. Enemies were still pretty cartoony, but instead of items floating there and whatnot, you'd still pick them up off of a dead body or off of the floor, and even if they're glowing blue, they can still be easily missed. Ammo pickups can appear vague, so until you get used to what shapes they are, you won't immediately know what ammo you're picking up at a glance. Doom Eternal says fuck it to all of that, embracing the series' relatively wacky origins. New weapons float there and glow, so you never miss them. Here's your rocket launcher, it's got metal skulls and a beam of hell energy flowing through it. Ammo pickups are color-coded so you know immediately what you're grabbing, the HUD more resembles a dashboard of a high-speed vehicle than it does a realistic exosuit UI, with color-coded and bright indicators to show you what tools are ready for use and what aren't, and I welcome it. I liked the grounded approach of 2016's presentation, but Eternal's aesthetic is more concerned about being a fun game while also conveying information to the player quickly and efficiently, while also keeping a consistent art style. And if you ask me, I think that's more important for the Doom series than grounded realism. Biceps. Anyways, right, back to the 1-ups. They're more like 1-ups in an arcade game. It's not like Mario or Mega Man where if you die you're sent to a checkpoint and then if you run out you're sent to the beginning of the level. If you run out of health and end up using a life, you're sent back to right where you died with a couple seconds of invincibility frames. I do think that these are a bit broken and a little excessive. And yet the dopamine rush it gives me collecting them won't stop me from getting them. Since you can actually see the Slayer's in-game model, Eternal features a healthy amount of skins for the Slayer, but for the sake of this video I chose to stick with the default skin, at least for now. But man, you could customize a lot in this game. I left a lot of the settings at their default, but I do like increasing the HUD size since a lot of these things you need to be able to read at a glance, and making them bigger just kinda helps with that. Eternal wastes no time getting you familiar with the game. You can double jump from the get-go, you can find collectible action figures before the first real arena of the game, not to mention that the figures are of 
demons this time, not just recolors of Doom Guy, you find the heavy rifle in this first level as well as your first cheat code, which is something that you can use revisiting levels if you missed something, making the journey back a bit more tolerable, and also serves a secondary purpose that I'll touch on in a little bit. But before we touch on story and gameplay spoilers, all you really need to know is that almost everything about the gameplay in this game is a step up from Doom 2016. The movement, the gunplay, the demons, all of it has been cranked up to 11. Most heavy demons feature some kind of weak point or weakness, like being able to shoot the guns off of a Mancubus or the turret off an Arachnotron, dealing a bunch of extra damage to them as well as incapacitating some of their attacks. The combat loop here is just so much more fun, I think that I'll really only be going back to Doom 2016 just for novelty's sake. At its core, the plot of Doom Eternal is pretty simple. Three Hell Priests have partaken in a ritual to harvest human souls from Earth to fuel their supply of Argent energy. As long as one of them is left alive, the ritual cannot be stopped. Here's a shotgun, go save the planet. But in a surprising and, in my opinion, welcome twist, it gets a bit more complicated than that. Not only is the game littered with a ton of optional, well-written lore to help flesh out the world, but has plenty of in-your-face storytelling presented to the player with a healthy amount of twists, turns, fan service, and for once, a sense of stakes. But just in case you're one of the people who thinks it's absolutely appalling that Doom is putting an emphasis on story in the first place, you are able to skip nearly every cutscene the game throws at you, which is great especially for repeat playthroughs. Moments where you're locked into a room and forced to listen to Ultron lecture you are now a thing of the past, and you're rarely in a situation where you're forced to have exposition thrown at you. I, however, am not one of these people, and I think that the story and lore is not only welcome, but pretty damn solid both in substance as well as how it's presented. Anyways, I hope you didn't come into this game hoping to get an explanation for where Samuel Hayden sent him at the end of the last game, because it just starts with Doomslayer having his own Justice League watchtower now. How did he end up here? We're never really told, I might be saving that for DLC. This is the Doom Slayer's command station, aided by the returning Vega, powering a slipgate, and yes I did just say slipgate, that is a quake reference, allowing the Slayer to immediately access new areas and worlds all from his ship, meaning that not every level has to directly lead into each other, granting more freedom with art direction, writing, and pacing. And our first mission is hell on earth baby! Attention all demons, gather around for your bi-yearly shotgun appointments. But Mr. Travguy, I think you're forgetting something. That where's the pistol? Do you really miss the pistol? If you do, then damn, that sucks, but I'm telling you, you're not gonna miss it. This game takes a page from Quake 1. You start with a standard shotgun, and I couldn't be happier about it. The shotgun remains a decent demon-killing tool up until the final levels of the game, unlike the 2016 pistol that is thrown away the minute you get the heavy rifle. You even get both of your weapon attachments for the shotgun before you find the heavy cannon. Once again, be sure to go with the grenade launcher first. The triple shot has been reworked into an infinitely more reliable full auto mode, but for this opening area, it pales in comparison to the grenade launcher. You'll get a chance to try out both of your weapon attachments on the returning arachnotrons, whose cannons are conveniently above their head so they can be destroyed with a well-placed shotgun grenade. Yeah, arachnotrons in the first fucking level of the game. This early in the game, they really do demand your full attention. And like I said before, you do find this heavy cannon just after this arena, where shortly after you're given your choice of the first weapon attachment. The micro-missiles are okay, but the precision bolt is much more practical for this opening level. It does require six rifle ammo for a single shot, but does bonus damage against enemy weak points, and it can kill fodder demons like soldiers and imps in a single shot. You'll see a couple of heavy demons in this level, but not all of them have explicit weak points, but rather weaknesses. For example, Kako demons, yes Kako demons in the first level, can be instantly put into a glory kill state by shooting a grenade into their mouth, and they balance this by making the Kako demons way more aggressive in this game. It'll barrage you with projectiles, it'll freaking lunge at you. It's good to take these guys out as early as you see them in this game. He's also way more expressive now, and I kinda love him. You can also achieve this by using the Slayer's new shoulder-mounted grenade launcher. Hey, do you remember the throwables from Doom 2016? Well, I clearly didn't, because despite using them, I didn't even mention them once in my Doom 2016 review. But they're way better in this game. Not only because they're upgradable, making them actually viable in combat all the way through the end of the game, but are launched from a shoulder-mounted Predator-style grenade launcher, which doesn't interrupt your weapons. So you can launch grenades from your shoulder while raining down fire with your weapons at the same time. Oh, by the way, did I mention that this is still the 
the first level? While I'm all for this, wasting most of my adult life on Doom 2016, this opening level's complexity and difficulty is something on par with a middle level from Doom 2016, even one-upping its predecessor in Spectacle. I don't recommend starting with this game. Just minutes into the opening level, the Doom Slayer kills the first Hell Priest and uses his head to gain access to a demonic citadel where the ritual is still taking place. Ah, damn it, Doom Guy brought the decapitated head again. Unable to kill the priests, he sends a message, cocking his shotgun and making the priests run in fear just before being met by the mighty Khan Maker. Spelt like this. She's an asshole, but she's an unkillable asshole, at least for the time being. Doom Guy literally rolls his eyes and goes back to his room. <laughs> I kinda love it. Alright, I hope you're caught up on your Doom 2016 lore because this is where the divisiveness starts to kick in. The Doom Slayer takes a slipgate back to his flying fortress where Vega informs him that to locate the second Hell Priest, we need to upgrade the ship's Celestial Locator. Luckily, the Slayer knows exactly where to find one in the ruined city of Exultia. Or is it Exultia? Exultia sounds cooler. A city all formerly under Night Sentinel rule before they were all wiped out by a Hell. You find a pretty healthy amount of new upgrades here, including your first rune. You can choose what rune you want this time instead of having to find them at select locations, thank god. They're no longer upgradable, which also means that you don't have to commit to upgrading it throughout the entire game and lets you have a bit more freedom with which runes you want to use. I personally like to go for Chrono Strike, one of the three new runes in the game. It slows down time when you're holding right click in the air, which is great for sniping off weak points. Hey, Hell Knights are back! It's looking a bit, uh... Looking a bit purple. What if it was purple? I mean, I guess I won't complain. He's not going to be blending into the background anytime soon. They're a bit of a pain in the ass in this level, but they become a lot more manageable once you get the two main upgrades in this level. The Blood Punch and the Dash. The Blood Punch is fucking amazing. It's an incredibly high-powered melee attack that can be charged by executing glory kills on other demons, now giving glory kills a secondary purpose and becoming more than just your free health button. And the Dash. Oh my god, the Dash. I doubt Doom Eternal is the first FPS to have a mechanic like this, but I really would love to see this in more games. It lets you zip around the battlefield, dodge incoming demons on a dime. This is when Doom Eternal really starts to become more than just a reskin Doom 2016 and really starts to embrace its own identity. The Slayer breaks into the abandoned quarters of the late King Novik, formerly leader of the Night Sentinels, whose spirit meets the Doom Slayer, telling him that he can't kill the Hell Priests as they were once Sentinel blood, demanding the Slayer to abide by their laws because tradition. The Slayer takes the Celestial Locator anyway, takes a portal to Hell, and meets with none other than the Betrayer, the former Night Sentinel who sold his faction out to Hell in exchange for his dead son's resurrection, who was resurrected, but his soul was trapped into the Icon of Sin from Doom 2. The Betrayer uses his resources to upgrade our Celestial Locator, but also begs for the Slayer to reconsider, fearing that he'll suffer the same fate. Hear me, Slayer. When his heart is laid to rest, then his soul will be at peace. And so will mine. Oh, that'll probably be important. Alright, real quick, I just want to point out the small detail. You hear the theme for the Betrayer throughout this entire Hell segment, and if you're a classic Doom fan or have been sticking around with my reviews, you might remember this as the Chapter Victory theme from Classic Doom. Not only is this a really well-crafted throwback, but I think it holds a bit more intrinsic value. Doomguy returns to the ship to install the upgraded Celestial Locator, but not before doing... this? Yay! Oh, and also going fucking ham with the quad damage! Now renamed Onslaught for some reason. I like how they reworked the upgrades in this game. Every time you get a kill with it, it extends the timer a bit. It rewards you for killing smaller demons that normally you wouldn't waste quad damage on. I also love how you can see the Slayer's eyes reflect the color of the power-up he collects in the visor. Kinda reminds me of Metroid Prime in a way. Even if it is just a PNG recoloring of the concept art. Once geared up, the Slayer makes his way to the Arctic base, being met with Mecha Zombies, another incarnation of the Heavy Gunners, now resembling a goofy skeleton man, and the returning Mancubus. Not the same ones from 2016, those 
Mancubi had cannons naturally grow onto their arms, it was part of them. These are more Frankenstein recreations by the UAC, ripping off their arms and replacing it with cannons. Kinda fucked up, but I mean, they're demons, whatever. In 2016, you could just run up and super shotgun them right in the face with little problem, but here, not only do they blast you for a ton of damage, but leave a lingering hazard on the floor that'll kill you if you stand on it for too long. You gotta keep your distance from these guys, even if you destroy their cannons. Watch your day, bro. Watch your day! The cultist base is visually stunning, being one of the first levels to feature traps that you can use by shooting a big green light to destroy every everything in a predetermined area, with a really fun factory aesthetic to it. It's also not common to see a doom level with snow that lasted longer than, say, 5 minutes, though the arctic hell priest does have a few tricks up his sleeve, like the returning shield guys and the new whiplash demons, which I fucking hate. They slither around the ground and will attempt to zone you, sending large semi-homing shockwaves at you that launch you backwards. You do have the rocket launcher at this point, which has received a huge buff since the last game, which makes dealing with these whiplashes a bit more tolerable. And right after this first encounter with them, you can get the lock-on burst, which is strong enough to one-shot most heavy demons, including whiplashes, so as long as you're managing your ammo well, they won't be too much of a problem. It also turns out that the Hell Priest has been holding the Slayer's super shotgun here. Not just any super shotgun, but an SSG crafted by the Night Sentinels fitted with a grappling hook, and given some beautiful engravings. No tactical advantage. Which the Slayer receives by taking control of a fucking Revenant drone to reunite himself with his long lost love. This is the only segment in the game like this. I kinda wish that they had more of this, at least for optional encounters. The Super Shotgun. Oh my god. God, the super shotgun. Just when I thought that they couldn't top 2016's SSG, they gave it a goddamn grappling hook. It doesn't pull the demons to you, but instead pulls you towards the demons, which is borderline addicting once you get the hang of it. And if you play as aggressively as I do, this will become one of your main methods of traversing arenas. The SSG isn't the best without its upgrades, you do need to get the quick loading as soon as possible, because the cooldown time between shots with a non-upgraded SSG is a bit absurd. Once mastered though, it makes enemies hit with the grappling hook drop armor on death. This is absurdly busted, but also kind of essential for Ultra Nightmare if you want to keep your ass alive. The Slayer takes a train deep into the heart of the cultist base, discovering that the priests in the UAC are using it to strogify a race of once extinct demons into Doom Hunters, but as well as some other creations that foolishly attempt to stop the Slayer. Do you enjoy running face first into a wall? Well, you're gonna love the carcasses. At first glance I thought they were supposed to be the Vor from Quake 1, but they act more like the brains from Quake 2 putting shields over themselves and other demons in hopes that you deal self-damage with an explosive. Thankfully, much like the shield guys, their shields can be popped with a plasma rifle, turning this once hazard into a tactical decision. Oh my god, they brought back the Nightmare Imps! I haven't seen you since Doom 64! They're not translucent anymore, but they do disappear for a moment. It's so cool to see these guys again, even if they're called Prowlers, but their codex does confirm that they are related to the Imp. They're Nightmare Imps in everything but name, really. They were also technically in Doom 2016, but only in the multi player, which I don't care about. Most of this level is following the machinery constructing the Doom Hunters, from watching their hoverboards being built, seeing the demons being fitted with rocket launchers, and what first glance I thought was the Doom 64 chainsaw, before culminating in a decently difficult boss fight. It's best to keep your distance from him, though if you do manage to get close, a blood punch does bonus damage against the sled. And there's a bunch of demons around which can help you grind for health, armor, ammo, and blood punch. Oh, what's that? You thought it was over? I hope you're prepared for two of them. I'd argue that the second phase is easier than the first. The level design of the arena makes it easier to take cover from the hunters than the first fight did. The Slayer destroys the priest's guardian, the priest cowers and grovels, even tries to bribe the Slayer, until... Okay, so I want to talk about these coins real quick. We're never explicitly told what they are, so this is more speculation than it is canon, but I think that I figured it out. These coins are holding the priest's souls. When the first priest is killed, he says that his soul remains guarded and then panics once the slayer pulls out the coin. But the second guy? The slayer had to pull the coin from the doom hunter before he realized that he was defeated. I think that these are supposed to be soul insurance for the priests, being put into a guardian to ensure that even if they die, their soul is preserved. Which makes it really interesting considering the first priest. was the 
Slayer his guardian at one point? Did the Slayer kill his guardian between games? There's a lot that happened between games that wasn't explained, so maybe we'll find out in the future. The con maker ain't too happy about us killing the Hell Priest, despite her being a heavenly being, and says that the third Hell Priest will be moved to a discreet location. At this time, you have collected a bunch of these Sentinel cores, which can be used to open up doors in the hub, similar to the Valhalla in Metroid Prime 3. But if you hold off for just a moment and grab the railgun, which just finished 3D printing downstairs, now called the Ballista, you can get both of the weapon attachments for this thing right off the bat. Now, the attachments for the railgun, or Gauss Cannon in Doom 2016, were a bit broken, so it's reasonable that the attachments for the Ballista have been balanced. Siege Mode has been replaced with the Destroyer Blade and isn't nearly as powerful or mobile, but the new Arbalist attachment is fantastic, basically being a roided out sticky bomb that does bonus damage against flying demons, being able to one-shot Kako demons, and do a ton of damage to its painful big brother. Now geared up, it's time to take the fight to the center of the demonic invasion, a massive Gornest that manifested itself over an entire city. I absolutely love the aesthetic here, not so much the meat but the destroyed cities and buildings being held up by hellish tentacles and destroyed mechs. Oh god, it's so good. There is a way I'm gonna stick giant mechs in it. This level is also a bit heavier in platforming challenges, which, honestly, I have nothing against. I know this is a controversial opinion, but Doom, and especially Doom Eternal, are very agile and fast-paced games, so if you're not moving around during these platforming segments, you're at least moving around during combat. And I think that spicing up these little moments in between encounters with platforming challenges is a good way to test and and practice your mobility outside of combat. Go ahead and say that Doom isn't and should never be a platformer, but for what Doom Eternal is trying to be, I think it fits. Though Eternal is much less concerned about realism at this point, so sometimes it does feel like you're running around Bowser's castle in first person. We also meet the Dreadnoughts here, a cybernetically enhanced Hell Knight armed with massive energy blades extending his range, letting him leave hazards on the floor, and being able to snipe you with a sword beam. They're mean motherfuckers, but falter easily to the chain gun found later in this level. God, what an upgrade. Possibly my favorite take on the chain gun in the entire series. It's back to firing the moment you pull the trigger, no longer requiring windup, making it much better for Eternal's fast-paced combat, and can be fitted with the returning turret mode, or my personal favorite, the energy shield, giving you a few moments to blast your opponents from the safety of your shield, and when upgraded, can be fired in front of you and falters any demon in its path. I know the turret mode has higher DPS, but man, I love the energy shield. What I don't really love is the buff totems, a new mechanic that speeds up all nearby demons and respawns them infinitely until the totem is located and destroyed. Typically they're not hard to find, and their location doesn't change on repeat playthroughs, so once you know where it is, it's not that big of a deal, and actually can be used to speed up the mastery challenges of some weapons, so I'd argue that the pros might outweigh the cons, but this first encounter with it forces you to kill some of the demons in the room and then search around these corridors for it after Afterwards, which is not a very good first impression. Oh hey, they brought back rad suits! That's... cool. In this level, I think they work fine. Some of the floors are covered in toxic sludge, and the suit absorbs the damage until it runs out. It's simple and encourages you to jump around more. I do recommend equipping the mid-air control rune from this point on, just so that you don't feel like you're being hindered too much from the constant mid-air movement. Much like the gore nests from Doom 2016, all you gotta do is destroy the heart to destroy the nest, which thankfully has manifested itself around the generator of this facility. And with both emergency switches pulled, the heart is fried to a crisp. Oh man, I love Metroid! The demonic invasion has taken a massive hit, but won't truly be stopped as long as the last Hell Priest is left alive, and Vega comes to the conclusion that the only person capable of finding the final Hell Priest is... Samuel Hayden. Oh boy, I can't wait to pound this fucker at- oh. The demons beat me to it. This level takes place in the Ark Complex, a team of former UAC members rebelling against Hell in the UAC, using their technology to fight off the demonic invasion. Those mechs that you see all around Earth? those were theirs. This level is great, but damn, it's long. Even on repeat playthroughs, this level can take up to 45 minutes. The compound has been overtaken by these massive tentacles, immune to the Slayer's firearms, but not the massive turrets that have been keeping the facility guarded. So it's up to you to make your way through the ruined city to reach the turrets to open the gate. Which 
really gives me classic Doom vibes with how the level handles the backtracking. The level is pretty well designed where routing is a lot easier to manage. You also get a ton of lore in the form of codex entries, as well as these audio logs. Reports of the Slayer from before the events of 2016 that confirm, yeah, the Slayer is indeed human, but there is something in his system. But we also get a look into Hayden after the events of 2016. He returned to Earth with a demonic crucible, took it to the Ark to synthesize a strain of Argent that doesn't require the souls of the damned, becoming a symbol for mankind and leading a massive uprising against the demons, which did end in a catastrophic failure, but before his defeat, left the crucible with the Ark, insisting that the Doomslayer would come back for it. Maybe he wasn't the bad guy like he says. Alright, come on Sammy, I need your help. His life signal is barely readable. Warning. Demonic presence threat level 5 entering main laboratory. Oh. You. Alright, let's just get this over with. Wait, wasn't that guy supposed to be hard? Okay, so the Marauder. Easily the most controversial addition to this game, and it honestly pisses me off. Not the Marauder himself, I think he's actually a fun to fight demon, and maybe one of my favorite demons in the entire game. I'm mad at the people who say that he's a shit stain on an otherwise perfect game. Well, maybe if you guys would take the time to learn the game and stop- He's honestly not that difficult. Back away from him, dodge his sword beams, and wait for him to run at you and then blast him when his eyes turn green. I suggest quick swapping between the Ballista and Super Shotgun. How are you guys having such a hard time? If you have tutorials on, it literally tells you how to kill him when the fight starts. I'm sorry, I really don't mean to insult your guys' intelligence, but every demon since the beginning has had a specific method of taking them down which makes them easier, and the Marauder just takes that philosophy and cranks it up to 11. The Slayer must be 100% confident that he could beat the fuck out of Dr. Hayden if shit goes wrong, because he just plugs him right into the fortress without a second thought. Without any buildup, any any leeway, the first words out of Samuel's crusty robot mouth is that the final priest is hiding on Sentinel Prime, and that the only slipgate to take us there is in a lost city in the core of Mars, lost to natural tectonic movement. There is no easy way to access the core of Mars. There are no known pathways that lead there, Dr. Hayden. The BFG-10,000, designed by Dr. Samuel Hayden as part of the anti-demonic defense grid. I understand. Searching the coordinates to the BFG-10,000 now. You can't just shoot a hole into the surface of Mars. <laughs> I wonder if this is where they plan to give you the plasma rifle initially. Even if you do have it, it plays this animation as if you just picked it up. It's weird because they keep this, but they don't keep the Archvile cutscene from that first trailer. Come on, this would have been a perfect way to introduce the Archvile. After you're done killing everything, he shows up and resurrects and spawns all these new demons, giving you a clear idea what the Archvile does and how he works. Instead, all we get is this confusing introduction to him later on, but I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. We do, however, get an introduction to the new Barons of Hell, now boasting a rocky gray exterior with wrist blades. It doesn't look that cool, but once you start doing damage and blasting his flesh off, it reveals the badass flaming interior. Doom Eternal brings back Quake 2's destructible enemy system that shows the damage that you're dealing to the demon, which is kind of awesome. Cause now when you're locked in a room with multiple of the same demon, you can tell which ones you've dealt the most damage to by just glancing at them. It's more than just the brutality, it serves a purpose in the gameplay. The Slayer makes his way to the self-inflicted hole into the center of Mars using the UAC's BFG-10,000, which is only a reference to Quake 2 in name only. He rips out the power core, which turns out to just be your standard BFG-9000, and portals to what was once the UAC's surface base, which has been jettisoned into the atmosphere, platforming and making his way to the UAC's escape pods where Vega charts a path to the center of Mars, fights through one last wave of demons before... God damn it, wasn't there supposed to be a cyber demon here? We do have the Doom Hunter return. Don't worry, these are weaker variants, they're normal enemies now. 
You would have also seen these guys earlier if you were doing the Slayer Gate challenges too, optional challenge rooms that reward you with a handful of weapon upgrade points, as well as one of six Empyrean keys, which I'll talk about in the next level. But I guess they're saving the Cyber Demons for later. This next level is a massive lore dump, so let's take a break from Eternal and look at the Doom 64 re-release real quick. Specifically the new Lost Levels episode. Don't skip ahead, this will be important to Eternal in a minute. Aside from the unskippable splash screens at the beginning, I can say that this is the definitive way to officially play Doom 64. But honestly, who's even surprised? Even if the port had a million problems, I'd still rather play it with a mouse and keyboard than the dildo trident. The new episode can be unlocked early if you beat Hectic, that really complicated secret level unlocked by doing that cryptic barrel puzzle at the beginning of the game, or just by beating the base game all the way through. I chose the latter option because I wanted to see how well this held up against the fan-made source port, Doom 64 EX, and yeah, it's about as good. It's missing some features like vertical aiming, but that really shouldn't be a deal breaker for anyone, and besides, 64 EX is a pain to set up anyway. Being able to pay just $5 for an equally as good port, plus an exclusive bonus episode, is more than worth it. And these bonus levels are actually pretty good. They can continue right after the end of Doom 64, where Doomguy decides to remain in hell, taking him through some hellish areas, though some do resemble the UAC, which probably isn't a coincidence, with a drastically higher number of demons than I remember seeing in the base game. I've heard mixed reports on whether or not these were cut levels from the original or made just for this expansion, so if anyone knows, please let me know in the comments. A lot of it does revolve around switch hunting, but these levels are built in a way that opens up new paths to get you to where you need to go faster and greatly reduce back tracking, which is always welcome, as well as introducing some puzzles and mechanics that really don't overstay their welcome that weren't present in the base game. A personal favorite of mine is Cold Grounds, a level all about unlocking and ascending this hellish citadel, with some great fights along the way, though I really hope you like Nightmare Imps and Arachnitrons because this episode looks to them the same way that Plutonia looks at Archviles and Heavy Gunners. I'd say the most disappointing thing about this episode is that, at a glance, these levels don't visually stand out and appear like they belong in the base game, which, if if these were cut levels, that would make sense. The final level is easily one of the greatest final levels in any official classic Doom. You start with a basic Unmaker, and instead of you getting your normal red, blue, and yellow keys to progress, you're picking up the demon keys to upgrade your Unmaker along the way as well, slowly powering you up and giving you this absolutely absurd power trip, slicing through cyber demons with ease. Hey, remember when I said the Mother Demon was a difficult boss fight? That's because I missed every demon key on my first playthrough of the game. This is how easy she is with a fully powered Unmaker. Oops. You had not expected to be torn from hell so soon after your fateful decision. Getting back there was your only concern. The plans of the Sister Resurrector to exterminate you have failed. Wait, the Mother Demon had a sister? A grim vision takes- <laughs> Okay, I can't do that voice anymore, I might puke. Hey look, they quoted Doom 2016! Perpetual torment. Yeah, so the Doom guy somehow ends up killing the Mother Demon's sister, which creates a riff in space-time sending him to Sentinel Prime, where he's picked up by these guys, the same Hell Priests that we've been trying to kill in Eternal. Back to present day, the Slayer returns to Sentinel Prime, and although the Sentinels know that he's here to kill the Hell Priests, they let him back to their holy land because of tradition. Even this really cool looking angel that we never see again. What is his deal? I want to fight him. This is the biggest lore dump that we get in the game, most of it in these codex pages recounting the Slayer's past of how he rose through the Sentinels' rakes, going from an outsider to a revered member of the faction. But some of it is explicitly shown to us in the form of some flashbacks. Okay, so I've seen this scene be a bit divisive to some, mainly the fact that Doomguy speaks. The huge guts line, I think, is delivered pretty well. Guts. Huge guts. Kill them. Must kill them all. It's this line that I think borders on the cringy side. Rip. And... Uh, 
The con maker tries to stop the Slayer multiple times, begging for him to stop his crusade and even going so far as to resurrect his pet rabbit Daisy if it means he'll surrender. Oh no, that trick's not gonna work on me. I saw what you did to the betrayer's son. We're not about to have an icon of Daisy. So if it wasn't obvious by now, the con maker, the sort of leader of heaven, has been cooperating with hell. These angels aren't immortal, and ever since the father disappeared from heaven, the angels have been seeking out a new way to make themselves immortal by using Argent energy. So as far as we're concerned, she's just as bad as the demons, if not worse. She's taken full advantage of the Night Sentinels, using them as a proxy so that the Makers can interact with Hell indirectly. Even going so far as to confirm that the whole event of the Betrayer's Son being resurrected as the Icon of Sin was all orchestrated by the Con Maker and her corrupt Sentinels just so that Heaven could take control of the Icon. Literally everything is this fucker's fault. The Slayer returns to the Sentinel Coliseum being met with the final Hell Priest's Guardian which looks a hell of a lot like the classic Barons of Hell. That's pretty awesome. This fight is a lot like Doom 2016's Cyber Demon fight, except it's actually difficult. It's a two-phase arena, but he's got this walking, talking shield by his side, which is kind enough to telegraph his attacks. Hey, remember when I said the Cyber Demon played nuclear jump rope with you? Yeah, I think id Software might have taken that comment a bit too literally here. It's okay, it won't feel a thing! This stops nothing. That will be consumed regardless of what- The con maker is fucking- pissed that her plan to cull humanity for her own game has been stopped by the Slayer. And since the ship that the Slayer has commandeered is of Maker design, she saps power from the ship turning it into a prison, complete with a couple of demons to keep him busy. But not only that, she threatens to awaken the Icon of Sin to let him loose on the Earth to harvest as many souls as he possibly can. This motherfucker decided to kill all of humanity, nay an entire planet, just cause of some man-child with anger issues. The moment doesn't last long though, since the demonic crucible has enough charge to power the ship, which Hayden gets a huge kick out of. Hayden understands that the only way to stop the Icon of Sin, a Titan, is with the Slayer's Crucible, otherwise the Titan will eventually rise again, and directs the Slayer to the destroyed city of Teres Nabad to retrieve his own Crucible that the Slayer used to stop the first Titan that attacked the Sentinels. This is probably my least favorite level in the game. It's not that it's long, it's technically shorter than the Mars Core level, but it's just so boring. A lot of it has these swimming puzzles, which I don't hate, but I find them to be completely unnecessary. See, platforming is fine for reasons that I gave earlier, but swimming is only used for these puzzles and doesn't really do anything aside from providing a way for you to get from one arena to the next in a game that's really all about the combat. Thankfully, these don't really overstay their welcome too much, but they really didn't need to be here in the first place. Nope, you get back in your hole! Hey, you ever wanted to see when the Doom Guy went from Doom Guy to Doom Slayer? Take it. It will give you strength. Help you on your journey. Hey, that line sounds familiar. Take it. It will give you strength. Help you on your journey. Hold up a motherfucking minute. Samuel Hayden is the fucking Seraphim! So the Seraphim is a character that you would only know about if you read the lore of Doom 2016. He's the angel who gave the Doom Slayer the infinite strength and stamina he needs to take on Hell. And in Eternal, we see that transformation. But I did not expect Samuel Hayden to be the Seraphim. And it all makes sense too. He has all of this information about Heaven that no one would reasonably understand. Vega mentions that his bionic suit is of Maker technology, and for reasons that we see later in Eternal, this would explain Samuel Hayden's vast knowledge about Hell and its ties to Heaven. Maybe everything that Hayden did in 2016 and even before was to orchestrate the Doomslayer taking down the rogue Con Maker. We later find out that it was the Seraphim who took the Father from Heaven in retaliation for finding out that Heaven was collaborating with Hell. Really, it all makes sense. And now, they will fear you. The whole point of this level is to rebuild the Slayer's Crucible. Yes, rebuild. If the Crucible Blade is removed from the Titan, it could reawaken. So to prevent this, the Slayer breaks off the hilt of the blade to assure the Titan doesn't rise again, where Dr. Seraphim guides us to the Slayer's Vault where this coin is- what is with this game and coins? 
Okay, so you know how a lot of people complain about the chainsaw in this game really being only used for ammo instead of killing big demons? Clearly, they would never really played till this point in the game. The Crucible is a one-hit, one-kill weapon on literally any demon, even super heavy demons like Archviles and the later encountered Cyber Demons. It does sadly require a charge that can be picked up around the map, which I think is the biggest drawback to this weapon. I think that they should have taken a note from Doom 3's Soul Cube and have it recover one of its charges upon killing demons, maybe exclusively a certain amount of super heavy demons or something? If you're gonna borrow something from Doom 3, at least let it be one of the good things. And we do finally get the story of how the Doom Slayer ended up in that sarcophagus from the beginning of 2016. It all started when the Seraphim stole the Father from Heaven, the Father turning out to be an AI meant to keep the Makers immortal, resurrecting them like their phoenixes. The Con Maker, developing a hubris out of fear that her race is dying, strikes a deal with the Dark Lords of Hell, greenlighting planets and realms for Hell to devour in exchange for the human souls for the Makers to convert into Argent Energy. Not only was Argent made from the souls of the damned, but was literally created by Heaven's betrayal to humanity. It was around this time that the Makers caught wind of the Sentinels, impressed by their efforts to branch out across the universe, and over time manipulated the rulers of the Sentinels to do their bidding, converting Sentinel Priests into Hell Priests since Makers can't step foot in Hell and vice versa, constructing a massive Soul Factory for their conversion. Word did eventually spread about the Soul Factory, where the Slayer and a group of faithful Night Sentinels led a coup on the Soul Factory, only for the Slipgates to be sabotaged, spreading the Slayer and his forces randomly across Hell, where the Sentinels fought valiantly to their last breath except for one survivor, the Doom Slayer. Fighting until the Hell Priests dropped an entire city on him where he was entombed, kicking off the events of Doom 2016. That's so fucking cool. The next couple levels of this game are picking up where that crusade left off, taking the fight to the Soul Factory. Samuel Hayden, actually being a maker himself, knows that the inside of the Soul Factory has a stream of unfiltered heavenly energy that if ruptured can send us where no living man has ever stepped foot, heaven. But it's gonna be a long mission and the Slayer is unable to return to his ship for the rest of the game, so make sure to grab everything that you can. And if you have all six Empyrean keys, you can unlock the Unmaker, returning for the first time since Doom 64. Though it has been retconned to have been a weapon crafted by makers, not hell. Maybe it's like the Crucible, where there's a standard version and there's a hell version knockoff. Though with how it works, you'd think the Heavens version was the knockoff. It's not a bad weapon, I just wish that it didn't share cell ammo with the BFG. The BFG is balanced in this game by having more of a focus on clearing the room of smaller demons just so that you could focus on the big boys, and the Unmaker is the opposite of that, letting you clear out super heavy demons with less ammo than a BFG shot. And in that that aspect, I think that it works really well. However, BFG ammo is incredibly scarce in this game, and there's no rune that lets it drop from demons, so usually it's better to just play it safe and clear the room out of smaller demons with the BFG than to do the opposite. And the Crucible ends up being a better weapon to take out super heavy demons anyway. Aesthetically, it looks great, it's satisfying to fire, and is a bit more ammo efficient than the BFG. Again, I just wish that it didn't share ammo with the BFG. The Crusade Through the Soul Factory is a tough one, with plenty of higher tier arenas compared to what we've seen so far, with multiple Marauders, Doom Hunters, Barons, and even the newly introduced Cyber Demons, renamed to Tyrants. They are essentially mini Cyber Demons from Doom 2016, sharing many of the same attacks. Personally, I like to use the Chain Gun's Plasma Shield attachment for these guys, or the Ice Grenade once you have the frozen damage bonus perk. They also have my favorite glory kill in the entire game, which is made even better if you've blasted off some of their face, revealing the Terminator-like endoskeleton. <laughs> Fucking awesome. This crusade isn't just the Doomslayer making his way from point A to point B, he also does some pretty heavy damage against the forces of hell, even taking out the demon that's in charge of selecting the souls to convert to Argent Energy, and also is probably the closest we'll get to a first person mother brain fight. Oh hey, remember that Tower Babel we saw earlier? Turns out that was the Soul Factory, which deep inside does reveal the Maker origin, filled with heavenly technology made to process raw human souls. Heaven's looking a bit, uh, 
a bit spooky. The Slayer is here for one thing and one thing only, to stop the Maker's ritual of taking command of the icon of- Oh, he's got a body now! Not quite what I had in mind, I was imagining more bones, but I won't lie, looks pretty dope. Oh hey, it's the knife from the beginning of the game! We will not be able to control it! No! After destroying the sun's massive heart, the betrayer's son is set free. However, this means the Icon of Sin is free to do whatever the fuck it wants, and what he wants is to treat the Earth like his own personal sandbox. The Makers flee, the Slayer falls back on his head, and then it's back to demon killing with a mix of angel killing. These are the Maker Drones, living pinatas incapable of leaving heaven. Unless it's a Slayer Gate challenge, in that case they're immune to lore. They're your simple fodder demon, but explode into a fountain of ammo and health when killed with a headshot, meaning you don't really have to rely on the chainsaw as much in this level. The rest of the level though is pretty simple. Get back to Earth as soon as possible using a massive slipgate that Hayden insists we need Vega to configure. And guess what? System acquired. Setting a course for the Earth dimension now. I can't see now. I, the father, Wait, what? With the rings aligned, the Slayer is stopped by the Con Maker just before leaving, who preaches a bit to the Slayer but flatters him by referring to him as once immortal. Or, hell, maybe she's being literal. Makers are only killable inside of their own dimension, leading to a fight of sheer determination and desperation with both heaven and earth at stake. I really love this fight. She hovers over the arena, marking some of it with hazards, forcing you to stay on your toes. Just stay out of the giant orbital beam? That shit hurts. You also have a handful of these Maker drones around to refuel yourself without having to worry about the chainsaw. And once enough damage has been inflicted, hook her with the super shotgun and deliver a blood punch right to the chest. Lather, rinse, repeat until death. You have destroyed all that I was meant to rule, and all just to reject them. Oops, I forgot I was wearing a classic skin. Oh, you ugly! The con maker is killed, heaven is left in ruins, Vega is likely going to die unless that's him yelling at the end, and the Slayer takes the Slipgate back to Earth to have one grand scale rematch with the Icon of Sin. The final level is nothing more than one giant gauntlet with demons while you chase down the Icon of Sin, and it is exhilarating. There's not much more I can say about it. You fight basically every normal demon in the game. Multiple cyber demons, marauders, doom hunters, barons, the gang's all here, and culminating in an intense rematch with the Icon of Sin, now free to use his hands. It's a tough fight too. The first phase focuses on breaking the Maker armor off of him, which I do save a couple of BFG rounds to instantly knock off for free, assuming that you can make the shot. He spawns in endless waves of demons, but pickups like Chainsaw Juice and Crucible Charges respawn around the map, so I heavily recommend relying on your Crucible and your Chainsaw as your main demon killers, and saving your ammo for the Icon himself. The second phase is much more difficult. The Icon is a bit more agile and takes much more of a beating with the armor, but the Icon himself also has the destructible demon system, so it's easy to tell which parts of his body need to be shredded off a bit more. Once they're showing bone, it's safe to assume that that part of the body is done for. And after an adrenaline filled 10 minute long boss fight, the Icon of Sin falls to the Slayer once again, this time receiving a crucible to the exposed brain, and with the hilt snapped off, assuring that possibly for the first time ever, the Icon of Sin is truly dead. The Makers are gone, Hell's ultimate super weapon has been slain, and the corruption of the Sentinels is no more. And with his mission accomplished, the Slayer walks away from the mess that he's made, ending the game on a much higher note than any game since Doom 2. What will the Slayer do now? Will Hell ever rise again? Will Hayden or Vega assume command of the Makers and lead them into a renaissance? I guess we'll just have to wait to see what the future has in store, but overall, this is a decent ending, it's just a bit too short for my liking. But overall, what do I think of Doom Eternal? What is it not obvious by now? Doom Eternal is easily one of the greatest games that I've ever played! Though the levels are a bit on the long side, which makes dropping in for casual play a bit more intimidating, which I think is one of the biggest hits against the game for me personally. The game isn't perfect by any means, there's still a lot of room for improvement. I know that we're getting two DLC campaigns in the future, so I eagerly await for the team over at id to flesh out the universe of Doom even more. And speaking of the lore, oh my god, I can't remember the time when I've been so invested 
rooted in a game's lore, and it's Doom! This is not a game that you think deserves good lore treatment. Eternal's method of showing, not telling, and keeping lore cryptic enough, giving you all of the pieces to the puzzle, but making you figure it out on your own is something that I never really thought this series needed, but hey, I'm thankful for it. It never distracts from the gameplay, and arguably even enhances it at some points. But even if you're someone who hates the lore, you could still skip it. I do wish that there was a bit more in terms of post-game content though. We do have little modifiers in the form of the cheat codes, and the famine cheat code is cool. It prevents demons from dropping health and armor, effectively nullifying glory kills and the flame belch. It changes the way that you play the game, but it's the only cheat code like that. Most of the other cheat codes are just power trip modes. Quad damage, infinite lives, infinite infinite berserk sometimes. Man, I completely forgot about the berserk. The berserk is in this game, but it only appears in one level. That's a huge disappointment. And the cheat that enables unlimited berserk only works in certain levels. What a fucking letdown, man. Though if you do collect all of the cheat codes, which are in the form of floppy disks, bring them down to the Doom Guy's man cave, and you get a fully working wad of classic Doom, and also a fully playable Doom 2 by entering the code Flynn Taggart on the second panel. If you pre-order the game, you also get the Demonic Slayer skin and a classic weapon sound pack, which is fine. The skins you unlock in the base game, though, are way cooler than any of this, so it just feels a bit underwhelming. You can even unlock a Phobos skin from Quake 3 if you beat the game's extra life mode, a permadeath difficult where once you run out of extra lives, it deletes your save. It's pretty fun, but none of this compares to the classic suit returning. I'm pretty sure that they just polished up the Quake Champions model for this, but I'm not really complaining, it looks fantastic. You can also unlock a grey, amber, and red variant of the classic suit by linking Doom 1 through 3 to your Bethesda Net account, but because I synced the games to the wrong account, I got fucked over on these skins. The 2016 Praetor suit is back, which looks kind of terrible. I don't know if I'm just spoiled by the new armor just looking way better, but it just looks weird here. The classic sound pack, though, is a bit underwhelming. I think the novelty of it is pretty cool, especially if you use the centered view model, which again, takes up a bit too much of the screen. I wish I could just move it down a little bit. But this does kind of let you cheat in battle mode a bit. If you're playing as a demon, you can hear the sound of the classic chainsaw from the other side of the map. Oh, yeah, I guess I haven't really talked about battle mode. It's awesome in theory and when you're with the right people. It's a two versus one multiplayer mode where two people play as the demons against a fully loaded slayer, and it's way more fun than Doom 2016's multiplayer mode, but that's not saying much. At launch, it really sucked though, because if you got the collector's edition like I did, you had no way to add friends with this. So if you wanted to play with a friend, you would have to join a random multiplayer match and just keep your fingers crossed that you sync up with a friend. They have finally added a proper friend system for people not playing this on Steam, so that's a plus. At least the quality of the mode is decent. I'm not sure if it's using peer-to-peer -peer or dedicated servers, but it does seem to have a pretty bad problem when it comes to syncing all of the players together, where players will lag teleport all over the place and then be killed by something that appears to be behind a wall. It's frustrating and really needs some tweaking. <laughs> <laughs> you big green motherfucker! You think I can't handle the heat? You think I can't handle the fucking heat? Come here! They are promising to add this feature into the single player, letting player demons invade your single player game, which sounds cool, but at that point, I wish we could just get full co op. Or fuck it, just give this game mod support. The reason Doom survived as a franchise for so long was because of the modability, and if id really wants Doom to be eternal, they need to open this game up to modders by the time the game stops being supported. While the game was absolutely superb, I am a little bit weary of Bethesda going forward. Hell, we had that whole Denuvo fiasco a while back. The damage has already been done by the review bombing, and while I'm confident in id Software's ability to deliver an amazing experience, it's just their parent company that I'm a little bit worried about. And with Mick Gordon leaving the franchise, leaving the music up to a completely different composer, I'm not sure what to think. And at the moment, it'll be difficult to deliver a final verdict on Doom Eternal as a whole until the DLC has been wrapped up. Which you know damn well I'm gonna make a review of once it's out. And hell, why stop there? You think that I'm done with Doom after Eternal? I still gotta look at Final Doom, Doom 3 Resurrection of Evil, sure, why the fuck not? Doom RPG? Uh... <laughs> Do more PG?